Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and welcome to Reality Asserts Itself. This is part two of our series of interviews with Glenn Ford, the executive editor of Black Agenda Report. And if you'd like to know Glenn's bio, well, part one's all about that. And then there's a written bio underneath uh, on the, this video player. But we're going to pick up Glenn's story. So we left off. Uh, more or less, you're leaving the Army. So, so what happens next? Well, I got out of the Army in January of uh, 1970. Uh, I realized immediately that I had uh, no other skills than uh, talking on the radio, because I used to do radio in the afternoon on my father's uh, show and uh, finally did a, a uh, uh, show of my own uh, on the weekend and uh, did record hops all over Georgia when I was a teenager in, in Columbus, Georgia. So I knew how to talk on the radio, as I phrased it, and jump out of airplanes. Uh, so it appeared that I should go looking for employment in the radio. My father had, uh, was, had been fantastically uh, successful. Uh, he was booked uh, uh, somewhere in Georgia or Alabama every night uh, for two years uh, in advance. And being a popular uh, disc jockey, there were women everywhere and uh, celebrities and such. Uh, so certainly, as as I spent my three years as a as a broke GI, I I anticipated that when I got out of the army, I'd uh, go into dad's business. I'd go into dad's business, and uh, there would be women and money and song, and all of that. Uh, but uh, I found that people wanted me to be news instead. That made me very very angry what, because well, what? How did that? What does that mean? People uh, wanted people, you to be? People uh, at, at various radio stations, including the radio station in Columbus, Georgia, that is my uh, hometown. I, in fact, turned down uh, a news job because uh, I, well, I knew that news reporters couldn't do record hops and pick up that extra money and, uh, and weren't that attractive to, uh, to, as disc jockeys were uh, to the females. And uh, that's, that's how my mind had been uh, that's what my mind had been fixating on as I, as I neared getting out of the Army. Then I realized that I didn't have any job at all. Uh, so when the next opportunity uh, that same week came up to join James Brown's radio station in Augusta, Georgia, I took it up and I got to the station. It was before dawn on a Monday morning. The uh, general manager of the radio station showed me around. He said, there's your uh, news wire and here's your recording equipment. And then he pointed to a piece of paper on the wall and he said, uh, that's a list of all the big black folks in town. Uh, so whenever anything comes across the news wire, uh, you can call some of these uh, big black people uh, and get their comment on it. And I said, I was glad to have the job. So I said, uh, okay, boss. He left the room. I went uh, across the room and look at this uh, piece of paper and I discovered that it was full of reverend this and bishop that. It was a theocracy and I was disgusted. So I tore the piece of paper from the wall, threw it in the trash can and for the next uh, week or 10 days I immersed myself uh, in the real politics the grassroots politics of Augusta, Georgia. I decided I was going to find out who the real uh, leaders were instead of these accommodationist uh, preachers. And this is the civil rights movement is still very much. The civil up. rights movement had not arrived in Augusta, Georgia. Exactly. This is 1970. It also had not arrived in Columbus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. The civil rights movement did not arrive in many many, many places. And Dr. King didn't get to go uh, to many, many places because he was shut out of most cities in the South by a phalanx of accommodationist preachers uh, who didn't want any outside agitators any more than the white folks in town who they reported to. And that's, that was the cause of my visceral uh, reaction uh, to the uh, theocratic list uh, that uh, was up on the wall at James Brown's radio station. And that's why I sought out uh, the actual leaders of the community. And the first place I went was to the housing project because I knew that somewhere in that housing project there was a large and loud black woman who was actually the leader of the people who lived there. I didn't know uh, what her name was, but I knew she was there. And of course I found her. And that person became uh, my contact 
on housing issues. And I also realized that somewhere in Augusta, Georgia, there was a brother uh, who jumped up every time the police beat a black man down. And I found him pretty quickly as well. And he became my go-to person on police community relations. And I knew that somewhere in Augusta, there was a black entrepreneur, a businessman, uh, who was constantly complaining that the city and the county weren't uh, giving any contracts uh, to black folks. And of course, I found him rather quickly, and then into the uh, arena of education and so on. And w within 10 days, I had 10 uh, contact people, the actual uh, grassroots leaders of Black Augusta, uh, and those were the names uh, on the wall, the list of the go-to black folks. I informally called them uh, my committee of, of 10. And so every newscast, every conceivable development uh, would, would result in a call uh, to one or more of these people. So the owners of the station react how? Well, the owner of the station was James Brown, and he was usually gigging uh, somewhere. Uh, the preachers uh, didn't like being all of a sudden excluded uh, from the airways, but I didn't uh, care. What was most uh, interesting uh, was, was the growth of these grassroots leaders uh, from folk uh, who were paid attention to uh, on the street, uh, in the still segregated school system, in the housing projects and such, uh, but had never uh, been uh, afforded uh, the, uh, a microphone, uh, had never been treated as the leaders of their community. And yet, James Brown Station was the only 24-hour black station in town. That meant it had 100% penetration of the community. Everybody listened to it. Uh, and these people were uh, on the radio, which meant uh, that, well, they must be uh, the leaders. And they, in fact, quickly uh, grew into the kind of public leaders who could, who could hold forth uh, on their areas of, of expertise and, and interest. I watched them uh, blossom and grow. And, oh, no more than three or four weeks into this experience, uh, as, I, as I said, I'd been very unhappy, uh, earning only $70 a week, $52 after taxes, uh, as a news person, not the disc jockey that I had anticipated I would be. But seeing, uh, experiencing how uh, the control of this radio microphone uh, allowed me to play a role in changing the political complexion of a rather large black city. Uh, that did it for me. I said, well, this is, this is worthwhile work. Uh, this is, uh, I'll bear uh, the poverty <laughs> of it uh, in order to make this kind of social transformation. And how long before you head to D.C.? Oh, I went to, back to Columbus, Georgia, and then to Atlanta, then a period of time at James Brown's radio station uh, here in Baltimore, and then to D.C. by 1972. And you become, at a pretty young age, you become bureau chief in D.C. And yeah, after uh, local broadcasting on the, uh, what was then the number one radio station in, in Washington, WOL, uh, I joined the Mutual Black Network. At that time, there were two uh, black-oriented radio networks, the Mutual Black Network and the National Black Network. Both of them had about uh, 80 uh, affiliates. I became the Washington Bureau and uh, also did stints as the Capitol Hill correspondent, the State Department correspondent uh, you know, for that network. So at a fairly, I mean, when you're in Georgia, and even Baltimore, I would guess, pretty localized politics, localized news, you're now covering national and, and I, would, I would think even foreign policy news. It's actually the same formula. Uh, you don't go by the day book, and you know what that is. Uh, uh, that's where at 10 o'clock in the morning, all the events that are sanctioned by the corporate media and the powers that are, uh, are listed. Uh, well, I, that, that really is kind of like that list that I found up on the wall in my first uh, gig. You throw that away. And so uh, either at the, uh, at the local level or at the national level, 
uh, I made it my business to decide who uh, the spokespersons should be, the experts should be, the analysts uh, should be, and, and the folks who uh, uh, should be recognized as legitimate leaders of the community should be. Uh, the formula is the same nationally as it, as it would be locally. Now, this is uh, mid-'70s. Again, uh, a very, very intense period of conflict in the United States and foreign policy abroad. Um, what does this do to the way you look at the world? I mean, you know, you joined the army as, you know, as you, you described, you were always kind of political, but joining the army during the Vietnam War was not something out of the question for you. You chose it. Now you're in Washington covering international, national politics, and you're in the midst of, of, of a very controversial period of, your, of U.S. history. How does your thinking evolve politically? Well, where are you at? First of all, one has to understand that there was no such thing as black radio news until there was a black political movement. And that black political movement generated the demand uh, for a different interpretation of reality, G generated a demand for uh, media uh, to recognize uh, the leadership that was autonomously uh, uh, coming, uh, springing forth from black America, not a leadership that was uh, negotiated with uh, uh, old line uh, accommodationist leadership and the white power structure, but a leadership that was coming up through uh, the movement. Uh, and so when radio stations, and, and black radio uh, just exploded in growth in the, in the uh, last uh, part of the 60s and in the early 70s. Uh, and and uh, the community demand uh, for a representation of reality, that is a news uh, component uh, at those stations was so strong that even uh, uh, little radio stations in places like Sparta, Georgia, had to have at least one full-time newsman. Uh, but there was no template for what black news was. And so uh, uh, young people like myself uh, invented it as we went along, deciding who leadership was. That is the function of, of news media. News media decides what events are important and who is authorized to speak in, uh, on the importance of those uh, events. That, that essentially means that news media uh, play a central role in leadership creation. When you put a mic in front of someone's uh, face, you are designating them a legitimate voice. Uh, you are putting them in play as at least potential uh, leaders. So as we had uh, this proliferation of black news organizations at, at radio stations in towns big and small, uh, the, the process uh, was begun uh, of, of picking a new leadership out of movements that were popping up in cities all across the country and uh, at a national uh, level as well. The same process was occurring. Y you can't talk about leadership creation without talking about uh, media and, uh, and who that media is accountable so how, to. How, how far were you able to broaden or did you broaden the kind of voices that got to speak and did you run into some resistance as you did it? Well, that's why I made it my business to become Washington bureau chief because I then had the predominant say on not, in not only wh who were, was featured uh, in my newscasts but the material that was used for all of the other uh, newscasters in the mutual uh, black network. And what are some examples of, of people or in terms of the political spectrum, the way you were able to broaden it or change it from not just white radio, but I suppose even within black radio, you're going to have people that want to kind of have the official narrative and people that are willing to challenge it. Yeah, that's why you become a bureau chief, so that when uh, there is a, uh, a, a housing crisis, uh, I would recommend that you go to the National Tenants Organization, which was an activist, uh, very uh, progressive, 
uh, transformative uh, kind of organization uh, rather than, uh, oh, let's say the NAACP, which uh, even back in those days was uh, intricately involved, intimately involved with the banks, for example. Uh, we would direct the microphone to people who were not part of the Democratic uh, Party architecture, uh, but to those rising progressive forces that were coming out of uh, movements that were actually agitating at the local and, and the national level and treat them as the, as the leadership, as opposed to the old guard, who was already getting play, of course, from white radio. So what, what gave rise to America Black Forum? And tell us a bit about what it was. It was very simple. Uh, there, there was no black news interview program on commercial television. No black equivalent of meet the press, issues and answers, and face the nation. And you, of course, uh, know the uh, political functions that those kinds of shows uh, play. The, the, uh, certainly back in the day when we had three uh, uh, hegemonic uh, networks. Uh, the guests who appeared on Face the Nation in Issues and Answers and Meet the Press, uh, th what they said on Sunday uh, basically became the news for Monday and set the tone and the political conversation for the rest of the week. A tremendous uh, influence. And the fact that black folks did not have that kind of vehicle meant that we were never setting the tone for the week. So uh, it wasn't uh, that I was trying to reinvent the wheel. It, we didn't have any wheels. And so I decided that black folks needed uh, such wheels. And well, did you get, I mean, if, if you're taking these pictures that have been put on the wall for you and putting your own pictures up there, um, did you get resistance from, from I mean, I, who owned the, 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 the radio network? Who owned the TV network? Did they, uh, did, were you putting voices on they weren't happy with? Well, the radio networks were, were they're very, very different circumstances. With black radio, uh, black radio is uh, supposedly accountable to its black listenership. So it's quite easy uh, to maintain a black uh, conversation that is a conversation uh, within the parameters of of uh, of black politics on black radio. There's, I mean, who, who are you supposed to be talking to? It becomes much more complicated when you get to television, uh, which is uh, a mass uh, environment. We were very lucky. Uh, Channel 7, uh, WJLA, uh, the ABC affiliate in Washington, uh, had uh, was just going through a, a very long racial discrimination suit, uh, which had done a lot to tarnish its reputation uh, in majority black uh, DC and so when we made our proposal to uh, have WJLA as our as the anchor for our proposed uh, television uh, syndication they jumped at the idea uh, for, well, for political reasons uh, because this would vindicate uh, the station uh, they could erase some of the bad blood that they had uh, they had gotten uh, from this uh, racial discrimination suit. So they gave us very, very good terms and no uh, political uh, uh, involvement uh, with the show at all. We uh, had uh, total uh, editorial uh, control. And how were you dealing with things like, you know, in, in the earlier time with Vietnam, with the post-Vietnam well, period? Time, it's 1977. Oh, you yeah. uh, the same The same week this that Roots, the first uh, Roots, episode uh, aired that was the first showing of America's Black But Party. how radical voices could you have on or did you have on? Well, we had people from the Communist Workers Party and, and such. Uh, the black community, uh, the spectrum of black politics uh, is far to the left of the spectrum of white politics in, in the United States. So uh, if, if you are operating a mainstream black political operation, it's going to be uh, to the left of of a uh, general audience, i.e., white uh, operation. So what happens but, with but America? Our, but, but our, you know, as 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 a as a journalistic entity, uh, our our mission was, of course, uh, to expose folk who would would not 
uh, get exposure uh, in the white media, but it was also to confront uh, the established politicos in, in the black community. Uh, so within the course of a year, we'd have uh, most of the Congressional Black Caucus, which at that time only numbered about 16, uh, on the show, and we were quite adversarial uh, with them, uh, dealing with them from a, from a left black uh, perspective. Mm. And what happens to America Black Forum? Oh, uh, we got involved with some, uh, some partners uh, and we were not happy with the association. And rather than see uh, the show be destroyed by uh, conflicts uh, within, uh, we sold our shares and let them go about uh, their merry way. Uh, what, uh, here's what I want to say about America's Black Forum. Uh, before uh, this show, no black news entity of any kind uh, had been able uh, to, to generate news on a consistent basis, that is, uh, for its uh, transcripts and its press releases uh, to be picked up by uh, the Associated Press and UPI and Agence France Press and Reuters on any kind of consistent basis. America's Black Forum did that every week. And we were the only new black news operation uh, to do that uh, before uh, and after we left. Uh, no one uh, has been able to do that uh, since. Uh, I, I was most proud uh, of that, that this black news from a black perspective uh, 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 became fodder <laughs> Uh, for uh, CBS Newsbreak and for TASS and for Agence France Press and Reuters and, and the mainstream uh, media. Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we're going to pick up on this discussion with Glenn and talk a little bit about the whole concept of black nationalism, a black nation, even what you're saying in terms of a black perspective. It's a debate that's been going on in the black community and on the left for a long time, uh, right back into the Communist Party of the 1930s uh, and, and before. Uh, so please join us for the continuation of our interview with Glenn Ford on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.